Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next episode of Tilly. Tilly is an episodic series brought to you by the Lupus Foundation of New England. I'm your host, Marissa Zepieri. Many of you already know me as Lupus Chick. And today I am so excited in season five, episode three, to bring you Zarel Gibson. She was diagnosed with lupus back in 1997. She's going to share a little bit more about that. We're going to talk a little bit about mental health and lupus. And Zarel, I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for coming onto the program. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here to, to be here with you as well. You're like oh. famous in my world, so oh. I'm like, uh. <laughs> you're very sweet. I will. I'm very excited to have you here. And I want to kick it off for those of you who maybe aren't on aren't on social media or like on Instagram because we know each other through Instagram. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I am, like you said, I was diagnosed with lupus in 97. Um, I am an advocate. Um, I founded an organization called the Gibson Lupus Arc, which actually um, sends tells people about resources from all over the place to let them know they're not alone because a lot of them are right around the corner. Um, I actually am a motivational speaker. I am a mentor, a coach. I have, I have line, what is it? Classes course classes online that people can actually take and I put it in a I put it in a way where they can take like six months to take it because you know our body is kind of like all over the place so sometimes we need a little time <laughs> but those classes until you know learning entrepreneurship while you're sick so you can learn how to work even if you're in a hospital bed you know because the worst thing you want to do is worry about will I have a place to stay when I get out the hospital you know so yeah. learning how to bring in those type of funds and life and work balance and things like that. Oh, and I just got hired as an executive producer for the Bio Bootcamp, which is absolutely amazing. Um, it brings speakers on for a summit, a summit tour for health, wellness, beauty, and fitness. So looking for a bunch of speakers on there as an executive, produce, executive producer. That's amazing. Well, congratulations. I mean, you're such a strong woman and you're such a great role model for our community or just the chronic illness community in general, because like you said, I think, you know, figuring out how can I take care of myself and how can I financially support myself and work even with my health issues, like what's the best way for each one of us and each one of us, that path is going to look very different. So I love that you're teaching others just how to move forward with that. Um, you had mentioned to me earlier when we were chatting that even though you were diagnosed in, with lupus in 97, you probably had it longer than that. So I'd love if you can share with our viewers a little bit about your lupus journey. Like what were your initial symptoms? How was that diagnosis process? And, and what was it like to actually know what was going on? So when I got diagnosed, I still didn't know. But the process was I almost died. That's how I got diagnosed. So um, I was living in California with my father. My parents were separated or divorced. And I was living in California with my father. And one day I just had a very hard time breathing. And I called my mom who was in Houston, Texas and told her, I don't know what to do because I can barely breathe and it feels like I'm gonna stop breathing. So of course, you know, I'm, I'm young, I'm straight out of high school. You know, I'm just freaking out. All I know to do is call mom, call mom. Cause my mom was a nurse and she's my mom, right? So <laughs> she says, hang up the phone, dial 911 and open the door so they can get to you. So by the time the ambulance got there, I was literally sitting on the floor um, at the door. So they had to pick me up and put me on the gurney, you know, and, you know, lock up everything behind, behind me. So by the time I was in and out of consciousness, going to the hospital, getting to the hospital and still in and out of conscious, talk to the, talking to the doctors, trying to figure out, I, I couldn't tell them a whole lot because all I know is I couldn't stay awake long enough to even get a whole sentence out. But mm -hmm. when I officially just woke up and could actually stay up, I saw my mom. So you can just imagine how far, how long I was in and out because my mom had to find a ticket and, you know, get to me and then right. get to the hospital and all of that. So it was, I, it, it was some time that I was out. So basically they told my mom, her body is shutting down on her. And my mom was like, what do you mean her body is shutting down on her? And so they give all the medical yeah, all the medical yip yap or whatever. I have no idea what it was because I didn't know anything. <laughs> so all the medical yip yap that was going back and forth and they tested me for everything. And then my mother mm -hmm. finally says, test her for lupus. They said, no, we don't want to test her for lupus. She doesn't look like she, you know, would have all the symptoms. She doesn't have all the symptoms for lupus. It just doesn't look like we should, that's necessary. 
I am glad I have the mother that I have because she was very adamant and she made them test me for lupus. So wow. once they tested me for lupus, it came back positive. They gave me the right medication and I started coming to. So that's where my journey started. Literally almost dying. A doctor saying, no, we don't want to. And my mom saying, you're going to do this. <laughs> so that's where everything really, really started. So when I got the diagnosis and even after getting out of the hospital after that, my mom said, based on the way my body went, based on how my body was as I was growing up, they used to make fun of me because she's, uh, I always tell her something would hurt or something's going wrong or something. She's like, it's okay. We're going to tell Santa Claus to bring you all new body parts for Christmas. So mm -hmm. don't worry about it, <laughs> you know, and, you know, being a mother, just joking around, not right. you know, just thinking of it, you know, and my mother had lupus. So, you know, she didn't, she didn't think that because around that time they didn't say it was, it can travel down to your kids or anything like that. So she's not putting two and two together. So after my diagnosis, she was like, you basically have had this for most of your life, you know, and I had no idea, but that would happen to be one of those really bad, bad flare-ups that I literally almost died. Wow. Well, if only it was as easy as Santa Claus bringing us new body parts. Oh my gosh. <laughs> We'd be all be doing great. Um, and yes. thank God you have a, a parent that advocated for you and, you know, spoke up because, yeah, I think if we, you know, some of us don't present exactly the way maybe a textbook says that we are supposed to present and then things get missed and people don't get that dignity of having, you know, their, their diagnosis or knowing what's wrong with them for a really long time. So, well, you are definitely a warrior. Uh, you're, you were very similar. We both had it for a very long time. And, you know, you do learn along the way how to sort of re-navigate your life um, so something you and I talked about was lupus affects every part of your life. And one of those parts is your mental health. So yeah. can you, you know, and I know that you had mentioned to me off camera, you know, about <laughs> depression and things along those lines. So can you tell us how it has affected you in that area? So mentally, um, as a kid, I had a lot of chemical chemical imbalances going on that I didn't know about. Um, and it of course traveled on to as I've got older and older and they, I was never officially diagnosed with depression until actually maybe about a year ago. Um, and I said, when I studied on it before, I kind of knew what it was, but no one physic, nobody put it on paper and said, this is what mm -hmm. it was. So I kind of knew what it was. And I realized that because of the, the, imbalance that I had and why I was staying sad, why I would cry and things weren't happening, you know, nothing was happening and why I would cry at the drop of the hat to the point of the different medications they had me on, all the different side effects, you know, they don't tell you how it affects you mentally, especially right. if you're already in a mental state, you know, how it, it can do all kinds of things to where you want to commit suicide. You don't, you think it's the end of the world. You was like, there's no way I can get better. It doesn't matter how many people have gone through this. My case is always worse than anybody else's, you know, and it, it takes you down in a spiral. It is a really deep spiral if you don't catch yourself or have someone support there to catch you, mm -hmm. you know, and when trying to get out, it's kind of like digging, digging on the dirt wall and the dirt keeps falling back on your head every time you're trying to get out. So that's where I felt, I felt really incomplete within myself, you know, where I didn't, where I was basically fighting my whole life because I feel like. I shouldn't be in this cage, which is what I felt like, a cage, you know, and I just fought, you know, I, that's all I knew what to do, you know, I, I just fought, that was it, until I came to the realization of what I need, well, let me, not realization, but I got some help, I've gone, I've gone to church, but a lot of people don't realize, you know, prayer without works is dead, you know, is worthless, you know, so you got to do something, prayer right. is good thing but you have to do something so learning how to take care of yourself learning how to meditate learning how to you know wing some of those medications off I'll never tell anybody not to take their medications I just say medications are not meant to be long term because it's a chemical in your body you weren't born with it was just a chemical to help you through what you needed to go through so that you can move on to the next phase in your life and learn how and learn how your body it's very important to know your body and its movement like I know when I feel, um, when I have things moving through my body, because I can feel them moving through my intestines. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I can just that clear of a of an understanding of your body is very important from your mind all the way through. And I had to learn how, and it's still a daily struggle in learning how to fight the certain demons that come into your mind to tell you that you're no good. You're not going to make it. Your story doesn't matter. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you, <clears throat> you're back at square. You look like we're back at square one and you have to start all over again. You know, there's nobody around you. Where's your support? All these negative things that, you know, we allow to play in our head and we forget to tell it, tell, we forget to tell those little demons and voices that we hear, you don't matter. Guess what? I mean, they told me I would die. Well, I was supposed to die when I first got diagnosed in 97. Then I got out and they told me I would die at 24 and I'm 43, you know? So if you look at all the positive things on it, you know, it helps you bring yourself up out of a spiral and be able right. to be like, okay, let me take one foot and put it in front of the next to where we can get help, whether it's through therapy or through meditation and things like that. And even so some med- medical reasons, even some, med- even some pills do help out, you know, with anxiety and things like that. I just don't recommend them for every day or long term because those right. side effects. So you mentioned a couple of things, and I think that they're, it's so important for people, especially those maybe that are newly diagnosed or even a caregiver or a spouse or a, a parent to understand or at least know that one lupus can affect our brain. So that can right there affect the chemicals, how we're thinking, um, how we're able to react to things. And then we have drugs like steroids where steroids can actually cause psychosis. Uh, steroids can cause you to feel depression and a lot of a lot of emotions that maybe um, without them you are able to handle a little bit better, right? Or they're just not at the level, right? So you have a lot of things that could potentially be working uh, against you. So I think it's one really important to know, like, because without knowing that you may just think, what's wrong with me? And you may start believing those bad things that are going on in your mind that I'm not good enough. I'm never going to be able to, to do what A, B, and C does or live the way A, B, and C lives because my body's just not cooperating. And it it can feel very uh, lonely, you know, Mm -hmm. and you really do start to believe that you are the only person that this is happening to. Right. Um, So I'm with you, you know, I think support is a, a, a huge uh, help in this, but also um, I'm a big believer in prayer. And, you know, I think counseling and, and having a neutral party to talk to um, is also can also be very helpful and to help you work through things and sort of flesh them out a little bit. Sometimes when you're doing that with family and friends, it can be a little biased, you know. Right. Um, so I think count and now we have technology, thank God, we could see counselors online, right? You could see a Christian counselor, you could see a regular counselor, or it just depends yeah. what you need. Um, but so it, this is something that you've struggled with. So tell me, you know, because I've also struggled with in the past, and I know that you could have great days for months, but you might all of a sudden be hit with a hard day. So on, on those hard days, how do you show yourself love? And, and how would you explain to someone you know, how they can show themselves some self-love on those really, really rough days when you do feel like you took 10 steps backwards. So those rough days come when, um, like, now they're saying I have liver issues. You know, liver issues to the point they want to put me on a liver transplant. I don't want surgery. And that's just my honest truth. You know, so when I got that, you know, it hit me really, really hard. And a lot of people around me that, you know, I normally... They, they've heard some of my hard times, but this was something that just kind of like overwhelmed me after doing good for so long. Now, all of a sudden, I have to go through this. So you have that day of like, oh, my God, this is never going to end, you know, and you just want to crawl into your bed and pull the cover over your head, you know, and sometimes that's OK as long as you get up, you know. So what I do is I constantly I I have uh, affirmations that I repeat to myself and I have to make myself say them to myself, you know, and no, I don't always believe them right away, but I make myself say them to myself. There's certain music, you know, it, from any, any genre of music that you, um, any genre of music that you listen to, you got to listen to the positive of it, you know, don't listen to the stuff that drags you down and that's slow and, 
you know, it may sound sweet, but it's just something about the slow music that keeps you in a, a state of calmness where it, um, not calmness, it puts you in a state, a mindset where everything just kind of steady and it, then it goes down and it goes down and it goes down because it's more of a, re it's supposed to be a relaxing thing. But when you're in depression, it just puts you down further into that hole, like, oh, I should have been in love. Oh, I'd be so much better if he was next to me. And, you know, <laughs> just those things. But if you listen to songs like Happy by Pharrell or, you know, just um, I Smile by Kirk Franklin or something like that, that keeps you mm. uplifted, oh, you're not going to feel it at first. That's just right. not how that works. So not feel it. You're, you, you can't expect to just jump directly out of it. So when you work at it, you, you, I'm sorry, I'm at a loss because I'm trying to say when you work at wanting to be better within yourself, that's a start and you can head in the right direction to where you can be better. You get what, I hope I said that clearly. You can head in a, get where you can start being better to you, where you can even talk to somebody because sometimes you don't even want to talk to a therapist, you know, right. you just stuck into your head. You know, you have to you have to allow yourself to get out of your own head because being in your own head is what got you in trouble in the first place. You know, but we don't realize that, you know, just thinking about all the different things. It's like you try to talk sense into yourself and you'd be like, well, when you did it by yourself last time, how did that work out for you? <laughs> you right. Know? You, of course, you got to start it. But, you know, the race is not yours to finish alone. You know, you need a little help. And. That's kind of how I work through, I work through everything. So I get up and I, I listen to the music. I say the words of affirmation. I make myself look at myself in the mirror because for the longest time I had a really hard time looking at myself in the mirror. Could not do it for nothing. I just, you know, you comb your hair, you look at everything else, but within, within your face mm -hmm. and I couldn't do it. But I make myself look at myself in the mirror. You are beautiful. You are kind. You, you can do this. You've made it this far beyond what anybody else has, has said about you. You right. know, I, it's just those type of things that I repeat to myself. And then I listen to the songs and then I put myself in a work mode because I'm a person, if I'm moving around, it helps me put my mind on other things, you know, and just getting that positive momentum picked up. I love that. Until I can get to that point and be like, you know what? Yeah, this is what happened. That, 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 that. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be back in that. You know, I just need to be able to get it out. I couldn't get it out before, but I can get it out now. I love just having like that plan. And, you know, it might be a little bit different for every single person, but knowing sort of what works for you, I think is really important. And I always share with people, like, I love journaling. And one of the reasons I love that I've kept journals is, you know, even just as a human, even if you're completely healthy, it's very hard to remember year after year, all the little things, all the little wonderful things that have happened or things that you've accomplished that maybe you never thought you'd accomplish, right? I call these the small wins. And so I can always go back and look at the small wins list. And maybe someday that small win is, I was able to go grocery shopping and you know that took all my energy, but I was still able to do it, right? Or just take little a shower, things. little right. things. And then some days I was able to go to the mall with my friends all day. And then we went and had dinner and I had, you know, this busy, great day. And that was like an extra great day. Right. Um, but we forget all of these little things that our body has been able to do because sometimes when we have like these major things that hit us or we're feeling good for a while and then something happens, it, it does kind of feel like you're going backwards. So I love everything that you described. And I definitely think that, you know, just viewers can take, you know, pick and choose what works for them and then also find their own. Um, I did want to ask you before we go, you know, for because of what you're doing as far as um, work and, and working with others and coaching others, what would you tell someone that maybe can't do the job that they did any longer um, because they were diagnosed and their health has changed so much? Like, what's that first step to sort of finding you know, what's my purpose now and, and how do I move forward and also hopefully be able to financially like take care of myself? When you first were told that you can't do something that you've been doing for a very long time within a career you've grown to love like tremendously, it can be very devastating. But the way to look at it is 
you, when one door closes, another one opens. You were created to go from level to level to level. So maybe that level was meant to close so that you can make your, so that you can go to the next level of your purpose and your purpose in life. When you do something for yourself, it affects those around you. So your main focus is to make sure that when you, when you lay down and no longer wake up, what did you leave behind? What can people say about you? You know? Even, even though you're not able to do that one thing that you said you love, it's not the only thing in the world that you love. You have another passion in your life that becomes your purpose at your next level. So see what you can do on that next level. And not everything takes an arm and a leg to start. And people don't realize that. All you mm -hmm. have to do is become knowledgeable about how to make it happen and move forward. Put yourself in an arena which this lupus community is growing, lupus and autoimmune community is growing, hit yourself in an arena where you have a lot of business-minded people who can feed you information as you go. You know, we're here to give so that we can receive, not just receive so we can give. Mm. I love that. Thank you so much. Zarelle, you're such a doll. I'm so glad that you came on. I'm sure that everyone fell in love with you. So I want them to know on all your social medias, how can they follow you? I am under Zarell Gibson, CEO. And on Twitter, I'm under Lupus Advocate. Great. So if the Zarell Gibson CEO is Instagram? It is Instagram. It is Facebook. Um, you can even find me on LinkedIn. Perfect. Well, it was absolutely wonderful getting to know you a little bit more. And I'm so grateful for you to be on Tilly. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I hope that everyone enjoyed this episode. Definitely come back next week for the next episode of Tilly. And I hope you all have a wonderful night. Take care.